I acknowledge and pay my respects to the Onyata Aga, the people of the Standing Stone, the Oneida Nation, on whose homelands I am living and working. Osio Chichalagi, Paliwakar Dakwadoa, Shakonagi Chinela, Natohira Ari Hesti. Greetings, I am of Cherokee descent, a member of the Cherokee Southwest Township, and my name is Polly Walker. I'm living in the Appalachian Mountains and my life goal is that we may live together in peace. I'm honored today to be hosting two scholars who are working toward decolonizing peace and conflict studies, Kelly Te Maheroa and Heather DeVere. Before their presentations, I'd like to share a bit about Chalagi peacemaking, its marginalization in peace and conflict studies and the recentering of indigenous peacemaking. Indigenous peacemaking shaped societies in Turtle Island, what is now known as North America. Robert Conley, Cherokee Nation scholar and Chalagi knowledge holder, Diani Uaho, write compellingly about pre-colonial Cherokee peace villages. Sanctuaries where those who had stepped outside the boundaries of good law could live, learn, and move back into balance through ritual ceremony and recommitting oneself to guidance toward relationality, spirituality, and harmony. Before colonization, Chalaki villages were ruled by peace chiefs and war chiefs with constraints on war chiefs who only ruled for short periods of time when war was declared. Peace was considered the primary way of living in balance. Tom Bell, Cherokee knowledge holder and language teacher, explains that tohi, the root verb in the greeting I gave, na tohi adairi hasti, sums up the traditional Cherokee view of the workings of the cosmos and the position of the individual in relationship to the rest of the world. The processes embedded in Cherokee worldview are designed to bring balance to relationships between women and men, between groups of humans and between humans in the natural world. In contrast, Western styles of peace building are human centric. Furthermore, they've been imposed on indigenous peoples. We see in the world around us, the consequences of the lack of relationality and respect between humans in the natural world. We see global warming, climate change induced conflict and the current global pandemics with its health disparities arising out of colonization starkly apparent. In the field of peace and conflict studies, there's little engagement with indigenous peacemaking and even fewer collaborations of integrity to explore how indigenous ways of building peace might inform peace and conflict studies scholarship and practice in the global north. Many indigenous peoples and their allies around the world are resisting settler colonialism, recentering their conceptualizations of peace and their approaches to transforming conflict. These indigenous processes contribute to epistemic justice, redressing the epistemic violence of colonialism by recentering indigenous worldviews which continue to be mar marginalized to the detriment of us all. There's much work to be done to move towards justice, balance, and harmony in settler colonial nations and in the field of peace and conflict studies. And we will now talk about some of that work. So I would like to introduce Kelete Maharoa. Oh, kia ora koutou. Ko Auraki te Moka, ko Waitaki te Awa, ko Uruau te Waka, ko Waitaha te Iwi, ko te Maharoa ka Fano, ko Kelly te Maharoa Tokuikua. Kia ora, my name's Kelly Tumaihoroa. I uh, derived from Rakai Hotu, who was the first person in the South Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, my people are the Waitaha people, and we have uh, we hold on to a peace covenant, um, uh, and we follow Roko Morairo, the Atua of Peace. Um, my work, I've just completed my PhD, and with the National Centre of Peace and Conflict, where Heather works. Heather was my supervisor, um, and we've had a long-standing friendship since we met in 2012. Um, I've, I'm really looking forward to um, hearing more about what's happening in the IPRA scene. Um, Heather and I were there in Turkey in 2014, so greetings to our fellow colleagues. Kia ora. So you want me to have a call it all now, or over to Heather? However you want to do it, it's absolutely fine. Whatever you think brings the most life and meaning into it. Do you want to introduce yourself there, Heather? And then I can talk about my PhD if you want. Okay. 
Ko manga whai te manga, ko haure ki gauf te moana, ko pakiha te iwi, ko hitha de bia taku ingoa, no tamaki makaoro, aho. <clears throat> tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. I introduce myself according to the Māori tradition, even though I'm not Māori. I'm Pākehā o Te Iwi, a New Zealander who's non-Indigenous. One of the ways that Pākehā work with Māori is through a partnership that is represented legally by the Treaty of Waitangi signed in 1640 between the British Crown and some of the Māori chiefs. And the and the principles of this treaty have been incorporated into legislation and form and form the basis for negotiating this and negotiating the sharing of the land of um, Aotearoa. So I, I work at the Peace and Conflict Studies Centre in Dunedin, and I'll talk later about some of the other work that we do. But um, Kelly, as Kelly has said, um, we've worked together for many years and um, we are still doing that work. So um, it's really, uh, you know, it's a privilege to be part of this session with Kelly, who I'm, I very much admire for her work. And actually, Polly, you too. Mm. I'll talk about you later. Well done. Anyway. <laughs> Okay, so Cal, over to you. Kelda, thank you. So as um, Heather talked about, our treaty was signed in 1840 um, between the Crown or British um, government and um, about 520 Māori chiefs. Not everyone signed the treaty. So um, it was a sign of mana to have your name on the treaty. Um, as recognition that you had the power and the prestige to be able to sign with the crown. But also there was those that, like my ancestor to my horoa, who was a Māori prophet in the South Island, that refused to sign the treaty and refused to cede sovereignty. So I come from a long line of um, not only pacifists, but also, um, I guess, resistance to colonial imperialism. Um, so Rakai Hotu, who first came to the South Island, was around 850 AD. Um, and we come from a long line of extraordinary navigators, astronomers. Um, it's been said that it was the greatest feat of mankind for uh, man to reach the bottom of almost the world at that, at that stage. So um, that's kind of where the, my background and my PhD uh, is focused on Indigenous peace traditions. Um, I did a thesis within publication. So I had three publications um, and one manuscript. The three publications were highlighting my tribal connections and history. Um, and the, the fourth one, Heather and I will talk about um, together. It's um, exploring Indigenous peace traditions collaboratively. So um, the whole process of, of writing my doctorate was a decolonial process. I wanted to um, unpack what that is and what that is for our people. So uh, I really wanted to privilege voices of First Nations people. Um, for myself, that's privileging um, the Waitaha iwi, Rekohu, people on the um, Chatham Islands, the Moriori people, and people at Pariaka Pa in the North Island, um, because our peace, peace traditions have been hidden for so long from our people um, that they are almost forgotten. They weren't talked about, they're not taught in our curriculum. Um, and more recently in the last 10, 10 20 years actually, um, Māori have been portrayed as being um, warriors, um, genetically wired to be violent. And so that was kind of the catalyst for me to do my PhD is I've got five sons. We come from a, a line of um, peaceful living, you know, on Papatuanuku for over a thousand years. And I wanted to give my sons um, the opportunity to engage in our own history and also to share wider um, the, the narratives of our 
like yourself, Polly, you know, we, we were involved in peace way more than we were involved in war. It doesn't make sense to be warring all the time. And actually my people are, um, we have no artif artifacts of war. We follow Ruko Marairo, the God of peace, Atua of peace. So we didn't engage in warfare at all. And so I felt that it was so unfair of our um, education system to be not um, highlighting our, our actual histories. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's how I started into the, my PhD. Um, wanted to reclaim those indigenous ways of being and knowing, um, sharing our beliefs, not only amongst ourselves, but with uh, other indigenous people. Um, and really that, that comes with uh, decolonializing your own mind as, as that process and releasing those shackles of colonization you know, we are colonized people, Māori are colonized people. So in order to reclaim our spaces, we have to unshackle what is what has held us down. Um, and, and, and that can be a, a tricky situation when you're in um, mainstream education system, you know, and in our institutions, they are so, um, I don't even know if you, you can say, West, you know, they're so Eurocentric much much of many of the processes um and and they've underserved our people so i wanted to do something different um and then share that with others so that's what i what i've been able to do um i i put the the grounding framework as indigenous epistemologies and like you said polly again going back to how actually we are all interconnected our our cosmos our universe we are um, symbolically intertwined with all living things. So Māori have a very similar view, obviously, to many Indigenous people and First Nations people, that everything has a modi or an essence, right down to our stones speak to us, um, our, our waters speak to us. Uh, you know, every little creature is important. So that's where I came from that um, premise. And then of course, um, work towards uh, Kaupapa Māori, which is our indigenous, um, well, we, we say theory, but Kaupapa Māori is, covers so much. So indigen indigenous epistemologies, I looked at how philosophical questions and research can contribute towards advancing indigenous knowledge and Māori knowledge. So Kaupapa Māori um, kind of derived out of the, the movement of indigenous people globally in the 70s and, and 80s. And so for, the, for us, that was an opportunity to go, well, who are we and, and how do we fit within this wider um, worldwide movement? Um, it was a great time here in Aotearoa. We had land marches. Um, people saying not one more acre to be sold or taken by the crown. We had that push for revitalization of te reo Māori. Um, and it was a great time for scholars to think about in the academic space, what does it mean? You know, how can we advance our, our Māori knowledge? So kaupapa Māori um, is, has been used as a theory. It's also been used as a methodology as a method, as an approach as well, um, and as a praxis. So what does that mean? What does it look like in the practical sense? Um, it's, it's not difficult when you're working in that space, but for some people, they might find it difficult and try and pigeonhole hole it. But we just use it as a vehicle and a platform that works for us um, to advance our social cultural, economic, political aspirations. Um, so how I used it in my methodology is I looked at what I wanted to share and incorporate in, into my PhD. And like I said, I did it through publications. So I had three publications. Sorry, I'm just referring to my notes down here. Um, because I was an academic and teaching at uh, Teachers College, so training initial teacher in initial teacher education. It's a really busy space. Um, I was one of two Māori 
three Māori staff members, which, which ended up being two of us, left. Um, and so it was, it was difficult to find space for me to, to write. So I wanted to do it as I, as I um, went along, um, if that makes sense, in, in bite-sized chunks. So the first article um, I wrote in 2015, and um, that was Kaori Whakaheke Toto, Do Not Shed Blood. Um, and I wanted to do a piece around looking at historically what was happening for our iwi, for our tribe, but also have it future focused. Um, so I looked at the historical significance of Tamaihauroa, who's um, my ancestor, and he led a passive resistance movement um, in the centre of the South Island, um, because when four four years after the treaty was signed, there was a, a land per deed purchase called the Kent's Deed Purchase. And at that time, no white man had been in the centre of the South Island, which is actually where I live now. The land was sold from the east coast to the, to the bottom of the foothills. So my uh, tipuna was um, very upset with what was happening with the colonial encroachment. And um, settlers were settling on our land, Māori land at, at the um, coast, even though we had title and we had ancestral ownership, they were just squatting all over the place and he couldn't get any help from the government. So he said, right, I'm gonna take my people and we're going to go and move into the center of the South Island. It also helped preserve us from immunity, all the diseases, um, alcohol and English ways of, of being. So we wanted to protect being Māori. So that was the, the peace march, we call it Te Heke, and he went in in 1877 to 1879 um, and settled in Te Ao Marama. They lived there peacefully for two years, um, but they were eventually evicted by the government. There was an uprising at that time um, with Māori settlements reclaiming their own sovereignty. And of course the Crown didn't want that, so wanted to do everything they could to break our society at all levels. So they were forced to retreat back to the mouth of the Waitaki River. Um, and then the second part of that uh, article, uh, I talked about, talked with my komato, with my elders, a male and female elder, and I said to them, what are your visions for our future? And so that um, was, I thought was an, a nice close the loop almost um, at that time. The second article that I wrote was Te Aro o Raki Marie, which is the pathway of peaceful living. And as a result of that first publication, I talked with one of my elders, Auntie Sissy to my Haroa Dodds. Um, and when I was interviewing her, it was just a casual chat because um, we know that when we're working with our people, the best way to approach is in a natural setting. So um, I had a chat with her at her home. We, I gave her the option of how she wanted to be recorded or interviewed. Um, and she wanted to do it on video, which is really nice for us. And as she talked, and she talked for an hour and a half, which was awesome, um, a lot of transcribing for me, her great niece. But anyway, um, so I had a lot of rich data. So I was like, wow, this is really awesome. And then it kind of made a natural life story of her life. Um, and because I was doing my PhD in peace studies, and that is the co or the topic that she works in, um, it made a nice story, or it actually documented her um, peace activism, really, in, in her own community. And so that was really interesting. It was an unfolding story of her 25 years um, of peace building in her community. She's very committed to our own people, advancing our own people, but she's also um, really committed to her friendships with Toe Iwi, with non Māori, um, and building those friendships and partnerships within her, her community. So, as part of that um, article, we looked at, um, well, she talked about 
kind of that cultural regeneration and what we've done as a family to regenerate our old ways and bring them into a contemporary world, how we can keep our connection with our tipuna. She also talked about her political activism. She, of course, she didn't use those words. She used words like, um, they're destroying papatua nuku, they're destroying tangaroa, you know, talking about our atua and um, the effects of, of colonization on our environment. Um, so yeah, instead of uh, protesting, um, she, she talks about protection. And she would do things like um, when they were wanting to dam the Waitaki Dam, our, our river, our ancestral river, she led a, uh, a peace march. They actually closed one lane of the main highway here in the South Island, which is almost unheard of um, in terms of for a cultural event on the Waitaki Bridge. And she led uh, around 800 people on a um, peace march in silence to protect the water. And, when, and then they had a, um, an event on, on the bridge. Um, she also uh, talked about when she's, she's fought big um, electrical companies, powerful companies with millions of dollars at their, you know, at their fingertips and, she, and being that, that kind of that sole voice or not sole voice because she had a brother with her, the voice against um, commercialism and against destruction of, of our awa, of our ancestral river um so yeah and and i've just been at a, an event yesterday um in in our community in north otago and they said we were so pleased to see that you've documented that history because a lot of people recently have gone back to it and said what was that event 30 years ago oh it was the ancient waitaha treasures so i've been able to record that um, so that we can refer to it as well. So, you know, there's, I would say to our, our Indigenous people that there's real manu or power and prestige in recording what your elders are doing. Um, so I wanted to do that to make a record of A, what she had done, but also for us as the future generation or the generation um, currently, what we could do when we're up against those challenges and, and look back at what our elders have done. Um, the third article was retracing ancestral footsteps. <clears throat> and that came about in 2012. Um, we gathered together for our annual general meeting because as indigenous people, we are um, asked to how would you say, become a corporation, I guess you, you could say, so you can engage with the crown, which is actually quite unnatural, you know. Um, so we gathered together, we say as a whānau, but we gathered together under our annual general meeting. And it was 135 years since Tamaihauroa had led his people up the valley. We wanted to do something to honour him. Equally as important, we wanted to do something to honour um, the, the river, because the river and her tributaries had been under pressure. And we would say her, her Modi was diminishing, her life force was diminishing. So um, yeah, after 135 years, we reopened that valley for us as a whanau and a big family to walk through that valley and play tribute to the awa, the river and to my horoa. So we walked for 135 kilometers, um, one kilometer for each year. That's just, we didn't realize that until we had finished. And it was just one of the most amazing experiences of my life. Um, we came together as a family, uh, had to work it all out. Okay, what does this mean? You know, you have all the day-to-day -day things about traffic safety, because it's a busy time of the year. We did it over summer. Um, keeping people safe, keeping people hydrated, fed, where are we going to stay, all, all those tasks that need to be attended to. But the other part that was, um, you know, more special to our hearts was what does this mean for us as, as a whānau? What are, what are the karakia or the ancestral prayers that we're going to do when we, when we start and start each day and before kai and when we finish at night time? 
how are we going to um, open open the the trail really? Um, so we had a star ceremony the night before we started. Uh, we had a dawn ceremony. So we um, did karakia or prayers to the, the moon that was setting and the sun that was rising. Um, we started a fire in the traditional ways um, and we actually carried that fire. We call that ahika, which is our ancestral fires burning. So we carried um, the embers of the fire all the way through the valley to, to um, stop and have, have little bits of, or the ash is left in, in each of those spaces. So just to keep the whenua warm for us to return to. And we took the fire with us. So we also had to think about how are we going to keep a fire burning for five days? Um, how are we gonna transport that? We also took the ancestral water from the mouth of the Waitaki River um, all the way to the one of the sources at the Ahuriri River. So there was all that kind of cultural knowledge and, and seeking new, new ways and old ways and blended ways of um, carrying those traditions through the valley. As part of my PhD, um, I wrote about, or well, I invited families to keep a diary. So we had 10, 50 people on the Peace March um, in 2012 and 10 people kept diaries. And then I uh, transcribed them, obviously anonymized them. And they just became like a layer of what we did each day. Um, I didn't, I wanted to keep it intact. So that's the beauty of having a Fano journal, or what we call a purako or a narrative. Um, so I kind of, yeah, just sandwiched it, sandwiched people's kōrero or their, their experiences um, and presented it um, without analysis. You know, you need to thread it together, but it's, it wasn't for me to say, so what does that mean to these people? They could speak for themselves, which is so important and such a, um, a pivotal part of kaupapa Māori. Um, so yeah, and then a part of that was also um, my role as I guess an emerging leader within, within my tribe um, and saying, this is what we're going to do. Come on, Fano, let's do this. Um, we worked together, we had a steering committee. Um, it's about being the kanohi kitia or the, the face that's seen, the face that's leading those processes. Um, and, and to look, oh, titero, whakaroko, kōrero, um, you know, to watch, watch what's happening, to listen to where people are at, and then to be able to have a, have a kōrero, or let people kōrero for themselves. Um, you know, gone are the days where we need people to research on us, um, and it's so um, mana enhancing or empowering to do research with your own Fano for your own Fano, um, and, and a cautionary part to that is koe mahaki, do not flaunt your knowledge. So I was really aware that um, I, I think I'm the first person in, in my uh, tribe to have a university degree, um, definitely the first to have a master's and a PhD. So you always have to humble yourself um, and make sure that you're, you are serving your people. Um, yeah, so that, that was, that's an important part of, part of the process um, because it can be seen that participating in formal education is part of colonization. So I wanted to use my skills to record what's happening for my people, for my elders, and also for us to um, have, I guess, a pathway going, going forward. Um, that's about it for me, other than to say like, so I've completed my PhD, but you know, life doesn't stop as you both know, once you've done that. Um, so I continue to work for my people on a daily basis. Um, I've got a treaty of Waitangi claim um, with my auntie Sissy. She is 87 years old and her and I are co-claimants 
Um, our other co-claimant was Uncle Rangi Marie Maihoroa, and unfortunately he passed in 2015. So um, we're one of the last iwi to have our claim put forward. Um, many tribes were doing that in the 1990s. We were, we were trying to do that in the 1990s as well. We're still trying to do that. Um, there's been legal um, ramifications here. So it's been difficult for us because we're the first peoples. Um, and so may, maybe we're going to be the last people to have our treaty claim accepted. So I'm hoping for that. So with that, um, yeah, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora, I'll hand over to Heather. Kia ora, Cal. Um, yeah, so as Kelly was saying, um, we are lucky to have here the model of um, kaupapa Māori, um, which was developed um, a lot of it is credited to Professor Linda Tuiwai Smith. And a lot of Indigenous work also uses her um, knowledge and her um, research, her um, book on decolonizing Indigenous research. Um, and I also would like to acknowledge Polly because um, Polly, a lot of our students also use your work and when they heard you know we were having this session and I was going to be on a panel with Professor Polly Walker they were like wow I've read her work you know, so I'd like to acknowledge you too and also um, I would like to acknowledge Professor John Sinnott who um, mentored Kelly and I um, through the process of the book that we the three of us co-edited on Indigenous rights and peace building. So um, as I was saying, with the, um, the idea of partnership in Aotearoa between Māori and um, other visitors or other arrivals or other people who live in Aotearoa, the, there's this concept of allyship, so being an ally, um, and that's used by Pākehā, with Pākehā and um, other New Zealanders who want to work to assist in the decolonisation of Aotearoa New Zealand. And of course, not least is the decolonisation necessary in the universities. Um, so my part in decolonizing research in peace and conflict studies has been mainly by acting as an ally to colleagues and students who are doing this work, not only in New Zealand, but from many other countries and with many other Indigenous groups. Um, so the centre where I work um, is the National Centre for Peace and Conflict Studies, but we were gifted a Māori name, which is Te O, o Rongo Mararoa. Sorry about my pronunciation. Kelly's trying to get me better on this. <laughs> um, and it means the space for peace. So um, we it's a postgraduate centre and we host a large number of PhD or doctoral students. Um, and one of the ideas that came from one of our students, Dr. Michael Lingerlinger, was um, to co-edit a book looking at decolonizing um, peace and conflict studies through indigenous methodologies. And this was inspired by a lot of the work that was done by the students of the center um, and both Indigenous and non-Indigenous scholars. Um, for this presentation, I'm going to focus on some of the Indigenous scholars employing Indigenous methods and just give you an idea of some of the work that's being done. Um, so Dr. Michael Lingerlinger, he sends warm Pacific 
greetings and apologizes for not being able to be part of the panel today. And he, in particular, Polly, um, recognizes your work. So thanks you for this opportunity. Um, he did his PhD on domestic violence in Samoa. He is, is a New Zealand Samoan. And he used um, Galtong's typology of violence and Fa'a Samoa, which is the Samoan cultural approach. And um, he's, um, he himself is a Samoan high chief and his research was conducted um, at some high levels because he was able to interact with people at that level. And he used um, Samoan methods of Talanoa and Fafala Tui, which are um, used in different contexts appropriate to the status of the participants and the topics for discussion. And they're able to bring to light controversial issues within a respectful cultural framework. He's also done um, work on indigenous conflict. And um, with me, we, we did some work together on the friendship treaty between Samoa and New Zealand, which is New Zealand's only friendship treaty. Um, Another person I'd like to um, talk about is a respected colleague um, at AUT University, Associate Professor Camille Nackett. And um, she, she engages with, she's from um, Trinidad and Tobago, and she's developing um, and helping to develop some methods for doing research in the Caribbean. And she talks about liming and old talk. And this is where she's um, using the informal social activities of Caribbean Islanders. Liming and old talk are, are, are sort of casual social and political engagement where knowledge is shared. Um, there's a quote that in a way that um, transcends gender, class, social, ethnic, religious and regional boundaries. And the sites of negotiation are also, also like cathartic strategies um, for supporting each other. And so she's, she and um, some of her colleagues have, um, are starting to produce a Caribbean methodology, which is useful for negotiating social justice issues. And then we also, um, one of the people who is going to be in the book that we're co-editing is the esteemed professor is Esme Wood. Um, and he um, is looking at um, what are called Maraketa agreements, which are for successful peacemaking with First Nation peoples in Australia. And he argues that the traditional use of Maraketa which is also used to refer to um, international legal treaties, but it's a term about um, coming together after conflict with a desire to settle differences in a just and peaceful way. And so the, particularly he looks at the people of Arnhem Land, the Yolna um, people, and um, he's saying that this can provide a model for people of um, goodwill to build peace in Australia. Um, we also have um, Dr. Nijme Ali, who is has worked on indigenous resistance and activism 
as research in Palestine. And her work focuses on Palestinian um, activists actually in Israel itself. And her work's influenced by grounded, the um, yeah, by resistance theory and um, constructivist grounded theory. And she tracked the experiences of Palestinian activists using the concept of sumat that embodies the sense of steadfastness and resistance. It, and it includes um, also art, literature, and poetry. And not only does her work employ indigenous resistance methods, but she it was conducted within an environment of threat and danger to both her participants and herself. Um, she explains the concept of sumad as a continuing process of everyday resistance that can transform power structures. Another um, person I'd like to acknowledge is Dr. Babu Ayindo, um, who, whose thesis was on arts practices as decolonization and peace building. He's from Kenya, but he also looked at um, the arts and peace building in Mindanao, um, the Philippines, and also he went to Parihaka in the North Island of Aotearoa, which is um, another peace tradition, which Kelly and I will talk about um, in a minute. Um, and he's himself as a peace builder. He's been working through um, people's theater and the idea of theater for peace. And he uses indigenous storytelling. And also he used Linda Tuiwai Smith's decolonizing methods to guide his research and participation in and observing arts and cultural events that are challenging the colonial legacy. And I mean, so, um, Kelly's auntie Sissy did that. I think one of the um, theater events that she was responsible for was an open air theater event, wasn't it, Kel? Mm. Yeah. Um, so another student who is still doing her research is Kin Kin Lin, and she's working in Myanmar on peace building and women and using that as her, you know, the training sessions as part of the research. Um, she's, um, she's, she went back to Myanmar because she needed um, some medical treatment and she's been stuck there ever since she's and it's incredibly difficult to work there because the internet is very um, um, uh, fragile and she can't she has to go somewhere to to connect with the internet and with COVID and with illness and with um the also some violence taking place, you know, it's it's very, very difficult, but she's very um, determined and um, she's worked in this space for, for years. So she'll be reflecting on that. Um, Monica, Dr. Monica Caro, she's went to um, Jungle Mahal in India um, and she was looking at the grievances and everyday peace practices and resistance among remote villages that were affected by the Maoist conflict. And she, I mean, she didn't, she found that what impressed her the most there was the indigenous everyday peace processes um, that were carrying on in these conflict areas. And so she was engaged with the villages as part of that. And just lastly, I'll um, refer to the work of Obin Nweki, who's, he's from Nigeria and he was 
going to be working with ex-combatants in the Niger Delta region, which is to, to work out how how the integrate the reintegration of combatants into the local um, areas, well, how to whether that's happening and how how that's going to work. And it's about it's also about indigenous um, everyday peace interactions. He was to do face to face interviews and he was on his way there when COVID um, occurred so he's had to work out a way of doing to try and keep maintain the Indigenous research practices through um, interacting with intermediaries online so you know it's another area where um, some of us and some of the students will have to be working in the future about how how difficult it is to do what part of um, indigenous methods is the importance of building relationships and um, uh, you know face to face communication. Um, so just what is evident from the work of Indigenous scholars who focus on Indigenous knowledge about conflict, resistance to injustice and establishing peace is the importance of respect, face-to-face -face communication, acknowledging others, humility, storytelling, community, listening first, building genuine relationships, addressing injustices, healing and everyday peace interactions. And the methodologies used to research these aspects of indigenous culture and the people who have the knowledge and are the expert in these pr practices incorporate the same values. And this is what we need to learn as as non-Indigenous people to, to, to make sure that we are engaging even with each other respectfully and with humility. Um, so it's a very, um, it's very humbling for me to be able to be part of this and to have been able to learn so much um, myself. So I really thank all my students and colleagues and um, people that have been, are engaging in this work. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Now, I think the two of you had some things that you wanted to do collaboratively now before we sort of open it up into a dialogue. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> um, can I just say that we feel honored and privileged to be working with you, Heather. Um, Heather, Polly, and for, for our pro colleagues, um, the, um, it's just been so important to have Heather in the National Centre of Peace and Conflict for us Indigenous students. Um, although she's non Māori, um, non Indigenous, because she has the heart for, for us and, and she knows how important it is for us to have a voice and to be able to have a platform to. Um, share our experiences and, and perspectives. So um, I think that, you know, the, the previous book with um, John Sinnott and this book especially um, is a real tribute to you, Heather, and your ongoing um, relationships and friendships with your students that develop into working relationships and colleagues. So, yeah. So the, the third, the manuscript or is the fourth part to my um, doctoral thesis. Um, and really it came about through Heather. Heather was saying to me, oh, you must meet, um, you know, Maui and Maui needs to meet um, Mata. So there was, we come from three different peace traditions um, in Aotearoa. And we came together as a collective. We went to Rekohu, which is a wee island off to the east, to Maui's island. And um, we had a what we call a wānaka or a wānanga, where we sat there for a couple of days. And we talked about 
um, our different peace traditions that we bring, um, and then also the, the synergies that um, what, are, what is similar and what are the differences, and then also what are the challenges for us going forward. Um, and, and Heather really uh, was, was that, that glue that brought us together and, and kept that kaupapa or themes going because we're all really busy in our own um, tribal spaces. So it was really great to have those interconnections and someone to hold that space for us. Um, so as I said, we're three uh, different um, historic peace traditions, but with many similarities. So for Waitaha, um, my people, and I touched on this briefly, so we have you know, a peace tradition of all, almost 1200 years now. Um, for our period of occupation, there was no um, war implements, there was no warring. Um, so we follow the atua of Ruko Morairo. We went to Maihoro, the prophet. So, you know, around the 1800s, when he was um, sharing his vision for us as people in the future and also where we come from, his mantra was do not kill, do not shed blood. So that was, you know, we were not to engage in any kinds of violence or warfare at all. Um, and then, you know, obviously we've uh, regenerated our peace walks as a, um, to honour um, that kaupapa or that topic. Um, Maui Solomon uh, from Moriori from Rekohu, Chatham Islands, they have over a 500 year covenant, do not harm is their covenant. Um, so their whakaaro, the Moriori people, was that we are um, descended from Tane, who is the, the ato or god of man, um, and that men um, can engage in some kind of combat, I guess you could say, because um, conflict is part of us just as peace is part of us, but their, their um, overarching um, court it all is that no blood should be spilt. So as soon as a drop of blood was spilt, the war or the fighting would stop between the young man. So they were really um, similar to my people, pacifists. So they were on an island, Rekohu on the east coast, and they were invaded by two North Island tribes in around 1835. So the North Island tribes um, were being pushed down through colonization and wars and and I went to that outlying island um, and invaded his people, the Moriori people. And because they were pacifists, they got together and they were like, you know, there's lots, lots of the warring people, tribes coming, what are we going to do? So they made um, a pact to continue to live under their covenant. And um, on, on some of their old drawings on their trees, their people are like depicted like this with hands up, you know, we come in peace. And so they didn't fight back. Um, it's, it's a really dark time in our history of Aotearoa. Um, many Moriori people were slaughtered. Um, so his story is a re really one of resilience and um, um, amazing ability to rise above that. There wasn't a lot of Moriori people left. Um, but those that, that continue that whakapapa, that genealogy, um, you know, hold tight to, we, we live in peace, we go in peace to, the, to this day. Um, so they've recently settled with the Treaty of Waitangi, settled a treaty claim. They have a beautiful marae, kōpinga marae, on their island. Um, they have peace retreats. Um, and when you go in, they've got the names of the people of, of their ancestors in the middle of their marae. So it's a beautiful space. And then do you want to talk about Mata Farihoka Heather? I can't hear you. You're um, So when I was teaching um, about peace years, years before I came to Otago and the Peace Center, I had, I became aware of Parihaka, um, which 
is a village in the North Island and there was some knowledge about it, but it wasn't very well known in our history at all. Um, and then when I was at the centre, Mata Farehoka, who is one of the women leaders at Parihaka, came to the centre. And um, so I learned through her um, much more about the tradition and the peace um, tradition that they have upheld. And Parihaka was um, a pan-iwi community or is a pan-iwi community that was set up by two leaders, Te Whiti o Rongomai and um, Tohu Kākahi. And they, it was deliberately set up as a peaceful community. So the teachings were to live in peace and it was all my, it was set up too as a refuge for other, for Māori who were escaping from war. The, um, the way the village was set up was that they, they weren't, their iwi was not the main focus so they didn't have their iwi carvings on their houses because they were trying to create a community that was focused on the peaceful elements of Māori teaching and also actually incorporated some of the Christian elements from the missionaries. So it was a very unique um, place and not only was it focused on peacefulness but it was also focused on environmental sustainability as well as sort of technological advances because Parihaka had the first street lighting in New Zealand so the little village um, and it became a very um, well-known place in New Zealand but as Kelly indicated, in the 19th century, when the settlers were expanding throughout um, the land of New Zealand, these successful Māori communities were seen as a threat. And um, the, we, the, when the settlers and the government were um, expanding into the area where Parihaka was located, um, they were surveying the land and putting in survey pegs. They were taking down the fences, the Parihaka's fences, and letting the animals out and ruining the um, crops that were planted. And at night, the Parihaka men would go and take out the survey pegs and rebuild the fences. And the other thing they did, which is a very um, inspirational um, resistance, was they plowed their land to establish their claim. And so they would use these peaceful means as protest. And that went on for years. The, people, the men were arrested. They were, they were sent to places which were, I mean, many of them died in prison where they were imprisoned, mostly without any trial. And then eventually there was a invasion by the British um, mil militia and local militia um, and the leaders of Parihaka um, instructed their people that they would not shed blood, they would not resist with violence. And the children were sent with um, food that the women had baked because Māori have a very strong tradition of hospitality so there were people coming and they were going to show them hospitality and they baked bread. The children took them, the soldiers. I mean, it was a 
they were very nonplussed at first because, you know, they were not used to having hospitable reception when they arrived. Um, and they had a cannon that was lined up um, at the community. The women sat in front, the men were behind. So the women, it was a very strong presence. And eventually they, the soldiers did come in, they, they um, took the men. And what we only know very recently is that they stayed on and they raped the women. And that was something that has only been revealed actually last year. It had been kept as part of the community's um, protection of their, their selves and their women. And it's only since there was a, um, there's been a deed of, deed of reconciliation signed now between Parihaka and the government. Because Parihaka wasn't iwi based, tribal based, there was not a mechanism within the um, Waitangi Tribunal settlement process because it was based on iwi. So Parihaka has recently now got a legal Ent are recognized as an legal entity that can now negotiate with the Crown as a as a um, organization. So it's been um, the the village itself, there have been people who've stayed and the village itself is very basic um, there's no, you know, there's no more street lighting or anything like that. It was ransacked. So the, the people have had to build with no money, no funding, no support. Um, and so it's really uh, demonstrates, you know, that it's the same as Waitaha and Moriori, that firm stand for peace despite really terrible outcomes so that's you know it's like oh you need to defend yourself because otherwise look what happens but now regenerating and being a model for for us who are trying to look for ways of um interacting peacefully so so for me to be able to work with kelly Marta, and maui you know, it was new information for us, for the peace and conflict studies, for even New Zealand, New Zealanders, for, for school children. And most people do not know about Waitaha even now. Some people know about Parihaka, not everybody. It's still a new thing. And the same with Moriori. There's a, there's a version of history taught in our schools, which is completely incorrect. So, you know, even though New Zealand um, prides itself as being a party of peace, that we're very high on the Global Peace Index, we have some shameful history related to that, and it's only really just been revealed now, but we have these models, Māori and Moriori models, for what are the essential values that we need for peace and conflict studies. So we're so fortunate in New Zealand in a lot of ways that we can work, work, and we are, we do have some mechanisms for these partnerships, but certainly we have an awful long way to go. Yeah. And on the 17th and 18th of each month. Yes. Um, the invasion, the people at Parihaka open their arms and their doors to people that come and visit the village. Um, so there's two marae or, or um, meeting houses. Um, so they have one day each when they invite visitors. So um, there's people from all over the world visit Parihaka because um, Gandhi was interested in what was happening. So he read some of the... And, um, Tafiti and Tohu were avid um, writers 
Um, so they wrote a lot of what was happening and, and also a lot of their history, which um, Gandhi was interested in. He read some of that. So there's that nice link with, you know, um, the Gandhi movement in India. And then also um, Martin Luther King was inspired by Gandhi. So we have this um, passive resistance movement that has um, kind of grown out of Aotearoa, but also been a, a part of that ripple of, of passive resistance around the world. So um, yeah, it's, it's um, a history that has been marginalized, that has been um, hidden for a long time, but um, is, you know, I think that everyone realizes that the way we've been living as human beings and treating each other and treating our living creatures and, and environment is absolutely unsustainable. So looking for new ways of engaging and um, yeah, just resurrecting those those old old ways of of living harmoniously with with Mother Earth. Is, is important. Thank you very much. I find this very powerful and, and moving and, and inspirational and also heartache making, you know, to hear how yeah. people who are resisting were treated and, and were abused. Um, and I'm hoping that, I know I'll find it fascinating if we open this up now into a dialogue and I'm hoping our listeners will find it interesting too. And, and I'd like to open with a question around what, and in the Indigenous Education Institute that I chair, we have a term that we call collaboration of integrity. And it's our term for that respectful kind of allyship. And a lot of the work that we do is linking Indigenous science with Western science, um, astronomy for large part, but also um, museum settings or how we record and share our knowledge. And we have you know, some thoughts around what makes up relationships of integrity. And I heard both of you describing some of these and one with that, that focus on, on relationships and relationships of authenticity and sustainability. And um, Kelly, I heard you talk about the way that Heather held space for that project that arose out of allyship. But I was just wondering for our listeners, what, what else would you say make up those, what we call um, you know, collaborations of integrity, I think what you said, you know, the authentic relationships, what kinds of processes or characteristics go into those? Um, can I, so I'll, I'll talk, talk about a recent example is we have what we call the Waitaha Tauka, which is our artifacts. So they're the largest collection and oldest collection in Aotearoa, and they're held, held at um, Te Whare or Waitaki, the North Otago Museum. Um, and that's been under refurbishment for four years. And so my auntie and I, so they've always been known to us, especially because we descend from the tool makers, from the artisans that created them. So they've always been known to us as um, Waitaha Tauka or Waitaha Treasures. Um, they were found on our ancestral land, which was um, somehow went out of out of our title and into park out or European farmers, and they were ploughed up, and there was this huge collection. So they're really important historically. Um, so we have been engaging. We went with the um, museum, and we've been taking taking pride and and having them kind of represented um, washed um, blessed um, you know and getting them ready to be showcased so they were showcased yesterday Polly which was really great for us but in terms of like having those respectful relationships with non-indigenous people um, what I would say is what's really important is to have um, either a memorandum of understanding or a relationship agreement is the foundation for to have a respectful relationship. One that honours what both parties bring to the table, but also it gives the Indigenous people a voice at the table, a voice in decision making. Um, so we, we went back to that because when we went to view the exhibition two months ago, we saw they talked about early Māori or they talked about the Waitaki people. 
but they didn't talk about our ancestors, Waitaha. And I was like, who are you talking? Why are you doing that? These are our talka, our treasures. Where's our name? And it sounds, you know, it's so important to have your name there because otherwise you become invisible within your own landscape. So um, two weeks out when, in dealing with the, the council and the museum, we were still um, had different views on what the collection should be called because the family that found it on, on the land and then they gifted it to the museum, they gifted it and their name was in the gifting. So it's a Willits family collection. They were um, exhibited 30 years ago as ancient Waitaha treasures slash Willits family collection. So we were like, they've been, they have, haven't been exhibited for 30 years. We're bringing them out to showcase them surely we've advanced in our cultural understanding that the Tonga, although they were found by European farmers, they were made by our ancestors and they've been dated to 1200 AD. So there was no other tribal people around, just Waitaha. And we really, really had to go at loggerheads with the council and the museum. So over the last month, um, there's been almost a campaign by our people or well, there's been a, we had to strategically think about how we wanted to um, position ourselves, how we wanted to communicate um, with the organisations, but also through the media about, come on people, these Tonga were made by Waitaha, they need to be acknowledged by, you know, by the museum and the council as Waitaha. So, um, yeah, we finally finished um, with Waitaha Tauka slash Willits Family Collection, but that took almost two months of quite heavy negotiation. So in the end, we went back to our relationship agreement. What does it say we're going to do in here? How do we treat each other with respect? How do we uphold each other's mana or honour? Um, how do we ensure that these treasures are recorded and showcased as the people who made them so they remain with the indigenous people. So we were happy with the outcome, um, but it's not a very nice process for us to have to go through again and again and again to try and reclaim our identity and retain our identity. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the the it, uh, there's the there's the sort of conundrum of what universities are wanting with what respectful research often is because while a lot of the universities um, say they want collaboration the way in which universities operate mostly around the world and certainly you know New Zealand has followed the commercialization and um, of the universities um, and competition is really the driving force behind the universities I mean we are in competition with our colleagues we're on competition with other departments in the same university. The universities, you know, in a small country like New Zealand are in competition with each other. So that whole competitive aspect of um, academia is not easy to negotiate with collaboration. And I think the other thing you were talking about, Polly, the integrity, because it's also to do with the incentive, why are you doing this work and what is your intention? You know, is it to build up your, your academic profile and to, um, you know, advance yourself through academia? Um, or is it that you are genuinely wanting to make a difference? Um, and so, you know, you, it's, it's not, there are very few people who are able to do both, succeed through the university system 
and to do collaborative um, research with integrity um, still. You know, it's the exception rather than the rule. So it's not, not easy. And I think as Kelly has indicated, it's a constant negotiating process. Um, you know, you, you make a step and then you realize that you're being undermined again. So it's sort of a constant vigil that you need to have, which is exhausting. You know, it's exhausting for people. Um, the, in terms of for non-Indigenous people working with Indigenous groups, I mean, I think that we need to do more listening because we tend to go in there and go, oh, we've got this idea which we want to explore with you, you know, can you help us? And um, that immediately indicates that the research is not, it's for the researcher, not for the people. And that is, that is very, that's very common. So the actual, the idea of genuine consultation is also something that has um, been undermined because there are lots of consultation processes that we go we have to go through at the university constantly and everyone is asking to give their opinion and you know um, provide their ideas and and then they're ignored completely and Maori are very used to that they're very used to you know being included as a uh, to, in a tokenistic way so they can they can see it you know we are so we're so um obvious really in our in our lack of knowledge about how we interact um and i think to another part is um it, this is part of kapapa maori is he kanahi kitia, is it Kelly? Which is actually being a familiar face. And that means that you're not just engaging with people because you want their knowledge and their research. Even if you frame it as, oh, we want to help and we want to, you know, contribute and help you. But it's not enough to just do that and then complete the research, maybe even send it back for consultation and then disappear and into your next project. Because it's the genuineness of the engagement, I think, that has been missing. So it's not, it's also that um, we, it is a constant learning, constant learning process. So um, even me presenting other people's research um, is some is questionable because I don't know the details or the the essence behind what each researcher is doing. So I think the enabling or um, just um, being part of the indigenous voices having the say. Yeah, so here are my non-indigenous talking, you know. <laughs> yeah, I like that concept about genuineness and, and also the idea about having these agreements written out. So that they yeah. Back yeah. To, or people bring people, you know, back into account to it. It doesn't always work, Polly. Uh, can I just add that at the National Centre of Peace and Conflict Centre, um, which is, there's only one in Aotearoa, and we have unique Indigenous peace traditions in Aotearoa that are really important globally, you know, making those links that I made. Well, they, so the centre established a memorandum of understanding with um, Indigenous people 
um, in 2007, I think it was, Heather. Yeah, um, and that it was a bicultural center. So it's built on bicultural framework. That's 13, going on 14 years ago now. And they have not hired one Indigenous person in a permanent role. Mm. Even though it was highlighted at a conference at the end of last year. Um, and they've had two goes of recruiting people, but they still haven't hired anyone. So it goes, you know, you think, well, what are you, A, what are you looking for? And if you're not find, if you can't find what you're looking for, why can you not mentor someone into that role? Surely there must be someone in Aotearoa of Indigenous Māori descent that you can bring into the peace centre and um, scaffold, you know, and lift them up. Um, yeah. Indigenous people have so much to offer in that space. Do they really need to have a PhD, you know, a, a Western piece of paper when they bring so much knowledge, skills, experience um, with them, you know, that may not be valued in those Western settings, but needs to be. Yeah, I think the being a familiar face too is one of the things that Parihaka is, you know, the centre is based in the South Island, Parihaka is in the North Island. Um, EFE is a pretty expensive in New Zealand, relatively speaking. But since Marta came to the centre, which would be maybe eight years ago, um, the one thing she has asked is come to Parihaka. That is the first thing the community asks, go to Parihaka. That as Kelly says, they have every month, they have two days of, of consultation, of learning, um, and people from all, New, all around New Zealand have been there. But I think I'm the only person from the Peace and Conflict Studies Centre, apart from some of our students who've been to Parihaka. And it's still, it's the same country, you know, it's not that far. And every time Marta said, you know, if people say, oh, how can we help? What can we do? Come to Parihaka. And yeah, and it hasn't happened. So there's, there's, embarrassment to um, Pākehā in particular are embarrassed because we don't speak Māori, we don't know the protocols, we're not sure how we're going to be treated, you know, the accommodation is not quite what we're used to, sleeping all together in a, a marae on the floor, um, you know, so, so people are nervous about it but actually what I have found is yes I I do things wrong all the time but I am so welcomed and once you have been welcomed into a community you become part of that community you become part of the whanau and the next time you go there and there are people arriving newly to the marae you are in the welcoming committee. So it's hugely embracing when you do, you know, show up. And then it's not that hard being a familiar place because it's somewhere you, it becomes a safe space for you. So we call that uh, Pakia paralysis, which is when people are so scared that they just don't do anything, you know, yeah. and nothing happens. Um, and, and you know, it's like Heather said, you know, that when Māori are extending that invitation and it's not picked up, it's, Heather said, it's embarrassing, but it's also disrespectful to Indigenous people to not um, even look like you are wanting to engage in a respectful manner on their indige indigenous land. And it's about letting go, you know, of your professorship or doctorate title and, and going to Parihaka and, and helping them plant the potatoes at Puaka C 
see, you know, um, festival and, and being part of the, what they do, you know, harvesting and celebrating and discussion and debate and all those things. And um, on one day of the month, the whole morning is in Te Reo Māori. So it's in Māori language. So, you know, we can, we should be able to just go and engage or sit and just listen and just be in that environment where um, Te Reo Rakatera, the chiefly language of Māori is spoken in an authentic way when they debate it and call it all about what's happening in the world in Māori language. It's just, it's a magnificent space to be able to um, be in. The other thing is the actual consultation process because with Parihaka, with those two days, um, if anyone is engaging um, using Parihaka, teaching about Parihaka, wanting to do any research with Parihaka, what we're asked to do is to go on those two days and to present our work at each of the three marae that are that have um, opportunities for people to present their work. You don't have to do it in Māori. And basically, you stand up and you say what you're doing. And there will be a lot of questions and a lot of criticisms. And anybody can say anything. And people ask all sorts of questions. And then it is a kind of like a um, consensus process. And if there are issues that need to be dealt with, then someone will say, this, you need to do this. This has to be done first. But if they're happy with what you're doing, or if they, you know, they understand, they get, they see what the point of it is, which is most of the time. Absolutely, most of the time you get criticism, but most of the time at the end of the process, it's like, okay, thank you, you know, and basically you've, you've had the permission through that genuine consultation process. Um, and that, that's something that we, we also don't do very well, the consultation process where you don't have to you don't have to ask clever questions you don't have to be i mean some of the time people have been sleeping through part of your presentation because everybody is jammed into a room usually where we're sitting on the floor or on mattresses around the edge of the the room and people doze off and they say look i missed i missed that but you know um can you just explain it a bit more it's very um it's a very natural and gen again genuine process that um, you feel part of. Not everybody agrees, but in the end, they're like, "Okay, well, yeah, that'll, yeah, we're okay with that." So, and it, um, it's the forefront, doesn't it, Heather, for mm. pariaka, pariaka taka? So it's all about advancing what they want, that the research is meaningful and relevant to the people that live at Parihaka or engage or descend from Parihaka. So it's it's kind of a cultural safety in some ways for people that are wanting to work with and for um, the people of Parihaka. So you, you work in collaboration or that the people at least know what research or what's happening. You know, we have a saying, yeah. nothing about us without us. So that's part of that um, bringing people in, into your circles more tightly. And I think because uh, like Parihaka is the most well known of the three peace traditions there's a lot of misinformation there have been lots of people who've written about Parihaka and they the books are in schools and all of that and that's Parihaka wants to ensure that the stories and the history that is out there is now corrected and they have the knowledge and they now have a legal identity that can can do that so um, that's part of another process of who you know who tells the story and um, who who does the knowledge belong to
Thank you for that. And I have another question I'd like to ask because it's something that I grapple with a lot. Um, and, and it relates to, again, how do we build these collaborations of integrity in ways that, that demonstrate epistemological pluralism? And I know one of the hardest things in, in my research to even find a way to talk about and get anyone to look at was um, our concept as, as native peoples of Turtle Island, our concept as Cherokee, that the cosmos is alive and that the cosmos has agency and is involved in an active way in our conflicts and in our peacemaking. And, and, and we are positioned within the Cherokee and many other Native American traditions that the humans are the elder brothers and sisters, the one with the least knowledge. In fact, some of our Cherokee elders talk about how we had to get fit in to this really perfect balanced system. And how do you fit human beings into that? Um, you know, and yet I find I found resistance to that in when I was doing my PhD. And 20 years later, I don't find the academy or peace and conflict studies much more open to engaging with that as you know, our epistemology and an integral part of our peacemaking. So I'd love to hear from both of you, you know, what experiences you've had around that. Um, and Kelly, I think over to you. Um, I think that it's, it's an area that, like you said, people are still grappling with, um, but it is, yeah, I think we are evolving slowly. Um, and, and I'm talking about in the, in the Western or academic spaces especially. Um, and, and it's been difficult for Indigenous people to maintain their connection with their spiritual source. Well, maybe not difficult, but dif maybe difficult to voice that um, in public spaces. And um, yeah, so we have uh, movements over here, New Age movements. And um, so we have Waitaha, I say Waitaha of spirit, or, or um, we have people that can see our, our philosophy, I guess you could say, and that, so they don't have the whakapapa or the genealogy, but that's, that's that kind of New Age, so Waitaha of spirit. And we've had some books written by non Maori people of Waitaha of spirit. So that's a, um, a group of people there. And then we have Waitaha Toto, which is the blood, the bloodlines, you know. And of course, we, we, are, we are both, but we hold tight to um, our whakapapa, our genealogy. Um, so to be part of our tribe, obviously, you need to descend from Rakai Hotu, our founding ancestor. Um, and our, our family are very much in touch with the, the spiritual dimensions. Um, Tamai Horo was a prophet. Um, so they've written about his great feats of when the whānau were crossing a, a, a bridge and a train was coming. Um, and then he did karakia and held the train at bay. So the steam was still coming out of the, the chimney and the wheels were going round and the English people on the train were looking and wondering what was going. And he was standing in front of the train in karakia until his people came off the, off the bridge and left. Um, and then he um, finished his karakia and the train went on. And so that was reported um, in, in local newspapers. So that was in 1877. So we come from that line and um, I've had lots of my uncles and, and aunties have those experiences. Um, so we talk about it, you know, it's very much part of our daily life, um, but it's potentially part that you don't, and maybe you don't need to share. Um, there's, you know, you open yourself up to share what you feel comfortable in, in sharing and, and when people are ready, then you can invite them into those deeper conversations. But um, yeah, we're starting to see a little bit more of that, especially in um, in terms of health, health and well-being. How our spiritual and cultural dimensions are so um, needed for our mental health and well-being. So yeah, does that want to have a quote at all about that, Heather? Yeah, I just wanted to say that within. Um, 
you know, within the scientific community, the um, health community, um, there are now a lot of Māori scholars, a lot of Māori scholars, even though, you know, there's still not enough, but the knowledge, we have a lot of people who hold those two um, knowledges together and so they have the scientific training and the western ways of thinking and they have the Māori epistemological understandings and they are the ones that um, again are teaching us how to hold those two together and that they're not necessarily um, opposite you know, they're elements of something, they're elements of understanding, and that both can enhance the understanding and knowledge for moving forward. So I think it's, it's, it's not fully there at all, but it's, it's a movement towards that. All the time you see it, you do see it. Um, so I think that is, it's always so slow <laughs> and you always think, why is it taking so long? But it's moving definitely in that direction. Polly, it's a matter of science catching up with indigenous knowledge, eh? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, one, of the, one of the markers of my thesis is Gregory Cajete, who's a Tewa Pueblo Indian man, and he wrote a book called Native Science. And, um, you know, juxtaposing that. And then I've been involved in, in dialogues with that Leroy Little Bear leads, again, with quantum physicists and, and indigenous knowledge holders. Again, here are sciences side by side. Let's talk. Like mm. that space you talked about yeah. that you held for those two days, you know, and we talked together. We have dialogues for two days about our different sciences. Um, and I think that we need more of that because quite often yeah. it's always juxtaposed, sci you know, Western science and indigenous knowledge. And not that I terms of science is maybe the best term but but there you know where would we be without all the indigenous knowledge systems and practices that took place around mathematics around architecture mm. around agriculture yeah. and and you know bringing Salu the corn mother from a tiny seed to you know feeding millions of people um, and just a, a wider respect for um, I, I do have another topic that actually I, I can't remember which one of you raised it and it's a bit sensitive, but I want to raise it anyway in this in this format. And it's around the peace index because one of you mentioned that you do. I think it was you, Heather, that you know it, New Zealand looks highly ranked on the peace index, but yet doesn't you know include those issues around Indigenous peoples. And when the peace index was being put together, I was still at the Australian Centre for Peace and Conflict Studies that still existed at that time, um, and I was a scholar there, and I brought that point up. That, that needs to be, in, particularly in settler colonial countries, that needs to be integrated in there because it may look like a very peaceful country, but when you look at what happened when I was living in Australia at that time to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, if you look at the rates of violence towards Native Americans in this country and Canada, you know, they're extremely high. So how's that reflected in a peace index? And it, it hasn't been reflected in the peace index. And I just was wondering if your opinions do you think, you know, that it, it's worth the time and energy to, you know, maybe gather indigenous peoples together and approach that once again? Or do you think it's just a different kind of measurement and we shouldn't worry about it? Or what are your thoughts? Um, well, I think that would be a good idea, actually, because I think that there are elements of the peace index which are, you know, useful. Um, but it is a big gap and um, it certainly is something that, you know, we have the, um, the U UN um, rapporteur on um, Indigenous rights come to New Zealand regularly and criticise New Zealand quite severely for um, our... Um, indigenous relationships 
And of course, New Zealand keeps quite quiet about that. But I really think that it should be part of the peace index. Um, so yes, maybe that would be something we could work towards. What do you think, Kelly? I, I, I totally agree. And any opportunity for um, us to collaborate with other Indigenous peoples um, and, and lift the lid and lift yeah. those, I, I was going to say scare, but, you know, we have um, a high level of reported racism experienced by Māori and not only Māori, pe Pacifica people and refugees in New Zealand, even though we have, we score high on the peace index. So I think that it, it would be a good opportune time for us to look at what's the criteria, who's setting the criteria, um, and does it reflect um, our population? Have, have we got, you know, Indigenous people? Um, you know, what, what's important to Indigenous people and is that part of that criteria? Yeah. Good idea, Polly. <laughs> we have another project to work on together. We do. <laughs> are there, before we bring this to a close, are there anything in issues that either of you would like to bring into the dialogue aspect of our panel? Not, not I just from... think to encourage, just encourage people to, um, you know, and to, to the, this, this concept of allyship. I mean, a lot of my work's in friendship studies. And so this idea of allyship and friendship and genuine support for each other, um, you know, it's, it's something we need to do for, for peace genuine, you know, generally. Um, but I think that when we're in, in places where there are Indigenous people who have been severely disadvantaged and remain severely disadvantaged, then we have to focus on that. And I'll just add, add to that as using our voice, um, you know, and, and being able to um, highlight the injustices like Heather's talking about, being a voice for those that are marginalised, um, and also mentoring other Indigenous students so that we can grow our pool of talented Indigenous researchers and activists so that we can um, highlight the issues that are important to our communities and um, you know, work towards meeting their aspirations. Well, I would like to say, Wado, Gali Aliga, thank you. I am deeply grateful for you sharing your knowledge and your wisdom and experience today. And you were talking about this, showing your true face. And I, I remember you about them even going out on the front lines with a meal. A part of Cherokee peacemaking is to always feed the people. So I'd like to say thank you for feeding the people so well today from sharing of your own life experience. Thank you, Polly. Thanks, Polly.